still uh, I'm still getting used to this whole Google Hangouts thing. Apologies. So I'll yeah. I'll right. ask the question again. Um, yeah. Uh, All right. So the story is recorded. Uh, the story of the Sermon on the Mount is recorded in Mar uh, Matthew five through seven, Luke mm -hmm. six seventeen through forty nine, but it's not recorded in Mark. It's vaguely referenced in John because John has Jesus calling himself the light of the world. And you mm -hmm. see that phrasing in Matthew where he calls mm -hmm. the disciples, you know, mm -hmm. you are the light of the world. So why is it not in Mark at mm -hmm. all? Like not even hinted or alluded at in Mark. Yeah. So I think the, the first uh, thing before, let me just say something as a forward to answer the question, you know, Matthew and Luke are distinct in that um, Matthew is, the Sermon on the Mount and Luke is the Sermon on the Plain, which just from a yeah. top, you know, topographical kind of image or viewpoint, no pun intended, um, you know, is different. And I think, you know, Luke's gospel is, is my favorite gospel out of the four because it's got it's much more concerned about those on the margins, those who've been ostracized, those who've been put out by particularly by the religious elite of Jesus's day and Matthew who's wanting to communicate the messiahship and this and is the longest of the gospels yeah. you know really wants to hit home that Jesus is the new Moses is the and so this elevated mountaintop you know where yeah. Jesus is on the mountain uh fits some of Matthew's intention and then Luke's fits some of his intention where G this this Jesus is for the marginalized for the oppressed so specifically you know Mark is the first gospel written so um Mark is a source for both Matthew and Luke, and then there is a um, an additional source that uh, German scholars many years ago called the Q source, which is um, is is a is a source that we don't know who the author is, but it's clear that that source uh, influenced both Luke and Matthew in um, in uh, their telling of, of the gospel story. So Mark is the shortest for whatever reason. Um, he doesn't include that. Um, Jesus as teacher per se is not necessarily Mark's biggest concern. Mark is trying to make a very succinct argument that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And we see that through his acts, his miracles, not necessarily his teaching, but his, his miracles, his acts. And then, um, uh, and then uh, his death, uh, his crucifixion and then subsequent resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, that makes, it makes a lot of sense just from kind of combing through my, my, it's been a minute since I've actually dealt with Mark. I've been more in John mm -hmm. recently. Um, no, you're right. Cause Mark doesn't, he's not focused on Jesus as, as, as didactic. Mm -hmm. He's more focused on this is what he's done rather than what he says, and it's, mm -hmm. it's a very fast-paced, action-oriented gospel. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. In uh, fact, Mark's most one of his most common words is immediately. Immediately, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it has this sense of urgency uh, in the text. So there's yeah. no time for teaching. There's no yeah, time yeah. You, you got to keep going, keep moving. Right, you just got to yeah. keep going to get to Jerusalem, and that's and to get to the cross. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's that's actually a very very perfect segue for the next uh the next question um because he, Jesus is always constantly on the move. He's always um he he's got very little time for breaks and rest and um <laughs> one of your in one of your sermon series that you did a uh, you did a few years ago the second wind second light um mm -hmm. you mentioned that you know this it's and this was 3 years ago it was you know 3 years ago now it's covid Right, uh, which was when was a, it was a larger uh, uh, presence now than comparatively speaking it is uh, mm -hmm. today, um, and so it was this this moment that you put in your sermons of look, I get it, we're tired, but mm -hmm. but but Jesus is still he's still you know we still need to catch our breath you know mm -hmm. we, we we can't we can't stop maybe slow down mm -hmm. a little bit but Jesus moved forward mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. us. And he mm -hmm. said, you know, and you mentioned in your, in your uh, sermon, you know, Mark 16, you know, go out to Galilee. Like I told mm -hmm. you, I would be here right. So in that in that sermon. You mentioned, you know, Jesus, I guess, as 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 restorer or as the pace setter. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And in your other sermon, Salt, Light and Righteousness, you mentioned Jesus as a coach where you gave the story mm -hmm. of, of, you know, you coaching your your uh, your I think your child's basketball uh, yeah, team. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you have Jesus, uh, uh, the pace setter is the way that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, oh, yeah. And um, Jesus as coach. So uh -huh. mm -hmm. if you were to give that same, those same two sermons today, mm -hmm. in, in today's, I guess, 
you know, March 29th, 2023 mm -hmm. context, would would you still stand by, you know, Jesus is still the coach, Jesus mm -hmm. is still the pace setter, or has Jesus, I guess, taken on a new role to fit a new moment's needs or yeah, you know, something I, else entirely? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, specifically about the Sermon on the Mount, right? I mean, if we just frame it as Jesus's ethical masterpiece, right? Like yeah. it, it is, um, I mean, it's, it's his, it's his, uh, it's his magnum opus, right? It's his, it's the preeminent, I mean, it's the eminent sermon, right? Like the, it's the, it's the greatest thing he's ever said. And whether it's in Matthew or Luke, um, the message is the same. And, and I would say that he is always the pace setter when it comes to the godly life. Like, and, and I would say that, you know, there's time to rest and there is time to catch our breath. Jesus did that. He went to the wilderness to pray and, and to take Sabbath and, and to rest and rejuvenate. Um, but in terms of our ethical life as Christians, I'm speaking specifically about the Christian community and the individual Christian, um, you know, he sets the pace and his encouragement to use the more yeah. modern language of coach. Um, I, I think that remains. I think that's a consistent theme um, that doesn't mean that there's not times for pause or for rejuvenation, for um, for rest. Yeah. But certainly, you know, today uh, we we need to recover some of that pace. I think, um, and I know it's trite, the old "What would Jesus do?" kind of thing. Well, yeah. we know what he would do, right? We we read about it and we see it in his own life. So um, yeah. yeah, I still those images resonate with me, especially more thinking about the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. Yeah, and um, with that, with that sermon, and 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 I guess that pace is directed towards that specific goal, I guess, of 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 getting the message out there, mm -hmm. um, of but also who's the message, who's the message supposed to go to? Because this is Jesus setting. All right, this is my mission. This is what I want you to do. This is the calling. Yeah. And the Sermon on the Mount is where he disseminates his yeah. law in the same way that Moses was yeah. given, because Matthew fits that, yeah, that yeah. exodus yeah. Of, of, of illusion um so his his message there and it's it's resonated thousands of years i mean we're still talking about it now <laughs> that it's that it's made a massive impact is is mm -hmm. putting it very mildly so <laughs> I, I will ask you know why why jesus necessarily why his focus is on the poor because in matthew 2 11 yeah. he's given gold by the magi that's mm -hmm. one of the gifts that the wise men give and all that mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. what i want to know is if you're given gold you're probably not that poor <laughs> so yeah. i could be i could be very wrong i could be very <laughs> wrong on that so mm -hmm. why would jesus take his sermon on the mount and say no no, no blessed are the poor the meek yeah. the downtrodden the lowly when maybe you know he may not have been one of them entirely in the first place. Now, that's I'm not I'm not saying that as a bad thing. Yeah, I am yeah, yeah. saying that as no, he was given gold in this same book, and then he goes, mm -hmm. no, 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 it's not the rich who are going to get anything. No, 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 yeah, it's yeah. the exact opposite. Why would Jesus have his his entire mag magnum opus focused on a group of people that maybe he wasn't really in uh, focused on a group of people that he wasn't a member of his yeah. entire life? Well, it's interesting too to go back to the nuance between Matthew and Luke, and it's a great question. And actually, candidly, I never thought about the the. I mean, we of course every Christmas talk about the Magi and the gifts, yeah, um, and those yeah. have a great value. I never asked the question. Well, what did Mary and Joseph do with that? Maybe if yeah, it, you know, maybe it it financed their trip to Egypt when they heard about the babies being killed, and you know, all this. so yeah. Um, but that's a great. That's a, I'm, you've prompted that, David, in me. That I'm, I'm going to research on that. But um, my, Matthew my writes, says, "Blessed are the poor in spirit," and Luke says, "Blessed are the poor." Again, this juxtaposition where Luke is very much focused on the marginal, the poor, th literal the poor, where Matthew says "poor in spirit," which has this sense of humility and dependence upon God, which is again a differentiation. And in you know, and they both tell the story for different reasons, right? So yeah. Now, I, I would say that Jesus, um, you know, I have friends that uh, are often, they're prone to say that Jesus was homeless. You know, he quoted, said, uh, he said, foxes um, have holes, birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Yeah. Um, and he definitely lived nomadically, at least in his ministerial days, right? Like, yeah. um, and so his public ministry is what I mean to say. And so... He definitely lived on the generosity of others, welcoming him and taking him in. 
Um, so he wasn't without want. Um, I mean, he, he didn't, he, he had everything he needed is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, his focus on the poor is a, is a really, um, challenging part of the, 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 the gospels. Um, and I think it, it has a lot to do with who was marginal at that time and who was included in God's family and who wasn't included in God's family. And, um, you know, he fulfills Isaiah's prophecy that I'm going to build a house of prayer for all nations and all peoples. And, and he's finishing Abraham, you know, and I think this whole notion of being blessed, that that's another piece of it. That Greek word in, in Matthew, makarios, doesn't mean like prosperity gospel blessed. It means to be in the right place at the right time in terms of God. And yeah. so um, we're in a world that said, and even today, where wealth equals blessing. I mean, how many times do you hear somebody say, oh, that person's really blessed. They live in a 4,000 square foot house. Yeah. Well, Jesus is saying not exactly. You know, blessing is not about these material goods. Uh, it's about the the disposition that God has for for someone, even if they're on the margins, and the love that God has for them. Yeah. And uh, my uh, to to add to, I guess, uh, the mentioning, you know, what did they do with the, the gold? My 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 friend who also he's a pastor as well. He said, I uh, think they probably financed the trip. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I, oh, good. I'm in good company. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, um, and yeah, from one pastor to another, just kind of. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I just, just adding some, you know, because we don't get a biblical moment of, and they took this and did that with it. We don't get some right. sort of, some sort of allocative moment of what they did with it. But my, you know, for what my two cents may be worth, I, I've always thought that he put it into his education because you know he <laughs> he shows public speaking skills here. He can just go right. up to a mountain and he's charismatic. He goes, yeah, no, no, yeah. I'm going to start preaching. And Jesus doesn't this entire time. He doesn't call a crowd either. Yeah, yeah, and then he gives this timeless moment. Not just the, not just the, you know, blessed are the meek and the poor, but then he gives this massive uh, moment of the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, where do you think he? Uh, and and also because I know he's he's Jesus, very God of very God, and mm. and I'm not here to 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 say anything less than that. Yeah. But do you do you imagine that some of what's going on here, the 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 Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer, mm -hmm. how much of an influence do you think that? He got he. How much do you think of that? Is just from his own reading, his own uh -huh. revelatory moment, and how much of that do you think he got from John the Baptist? Yeah, because they're first cousins. So yeah. I imagine there's a little bit of you know a, a ministerial kind of mm -hmm. rubbing off on Jesus. Yeah, you know? yeah. I've not really ever considered the John the Baptist influence as much as I think of the. It's just sort of the, the what I would call the Jewish religious imagination that Jesus is. Yeah. Reared in. I mean, the Sermon on the Mount is a very Jewish um, sort of uh, piece, and in, in that, like, um, it it lays out what what's acceptable to God, right? And yeah. and the the sort of piety that's acceptable. Um, but the difference between what Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount is is that he he takes some um, sort of status quo understandings of who God is, who the people are, and flips them upside down, especially in the sixth antithesis toward the end of, you know, um, you know, where he's talking about, you've heard it was said X, Y, Z, but I tell you, right? Yeah. So you've heard it was said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you anyone that looks at another woman in this case uh, uh, with lust has committed adultery in their hearts. Right. So, yeah. He's he's doing a very this dialectical kind of um, uh, presentation in terms of its its sort of Jewishness, but he is taking the law of Moses or at least the way people understood it and turning it upside down and inside out. Yeah, and so Matthew, yeah. like I said earlier, and we you referenced as well, he's he is the great lawgiver, right? And that and that is is in the line of Moses and the prophets. Yeah. So I would say that if John the Baptist did, and we don't know, we don't have a record of it. But if, if John the Baptist influenced Jesus in any way, it would have still been, it would have continuity with that Jewish religious imagination. Yeah. 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 So, so to, to, to wrap this up, I guess, to the last question. Yep. Um, so why do you think this is timeless as it is? So, I mean, we're, we're biased. We're Christians. This is our yeah. big, this is the big moment. So if, if, yeah. 
if we remove that, we still have this massive secular effect because even even people that aren't committed to the religious endeavor, they still say, well, Jesus still said this. Yeah. Blessed are the poor. And, and you know, people outside the church still know about this, this big moment. So it, it's clearly hit some sort of dynamic resonance with the human condition, with yeah. human nature. Why, why do you think it's, it's placed itself so well? Yeah, that's interesting. I think because it's it's so counter to um, sort of the natural human instinct and also society. I mean, look, I, people may admire it, but whether they embody it or not, it's a whole other thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're Christians yeah. and we admire it and we don't always live it, right? We don't always live yeah. into it. So, um, you know, I think about I think about like going the second mile kind of imagery, right? Like that's not intuitive to us like in terms of our natural you know and i'm very augustinian here like in terms of our natural sort of disposition of the heart and so jesus is calling us to a new way of being human yeah right so it's it's aspirational um but it's also going to be realized i think that's one of the big debates with sermon on the mount that i know you're aware of is is this something that's temporal or is this something that is going to be in the age to come right yeah. so some people want to separate and say, well, that's just for heaven. You know, like yeah. right now you got to, it's dog eat dog and you got to do what you got to do. Um, I don't read it that way. I read it as something that can be realized on earth as it is in heaven. So um, I think it gives this aspirational sort of moral and ethic that, um, that, that, you know, is counter to the world. And, and, and we see when people live in that way and, and the obvious examples are like mother Teresa, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. We're like, hey, she's not a bad person to be like, right? Like, and I think I'm using that anecdotally, of course, but yeah. Um, but I think there is this aspiration, and and I would say again, Augustinian from, from an Augusta, Augustinian perspective, rather, is this like yearning to be that fully human, you know? And I think that's what captures the imagination, whether we're religious or not. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's I think that's every single question I've had. Um, right. right. I, I I will mention. Um, uh, I actually walked away completely remembering um, that it, one of the questions I sent you um, was, uh, you know, how 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 has I guess PCUSA? Because I'm not, I, I didn't grow up Presbyterian, so I, I this yeah. is new terrain to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, I don't imagine it's such a monolithic interpretation to ask how have how has right. that church understood that? Um, yeah. Is there like a is there a sort of general way that it's been interpreted that way? Or is that just kind of not the best question to ask? It is a little too vague to it. No, 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 no. I, it's a good question, but I would, I would just, I would, I would reframe it and say, yeah, because the PCUSA is part of the reformed tradition and the reformed tradition has certain ways of reading scripture. Reformed tradition comes out of Calvin, right. And, um, and then eventually, and there's different variations of this. It goes to Scotland, it comes to the United States and that's how, you know that's our theological sort of lineage yeah um, and and reformed people tend to and whether we end up in the same place or not read scripture not just as something that will happen in the sweet by and by like the the, the ethical yeah. life of jesus but something that happens and can transform the world today yeah. so we believe god is still active in the world god is still moving in the world god is still creating you know doing miracles in the world um, and we're called to be a part of that. Yeah. And so to read the Sermon on the Mount, I think from a foreign perspective is to say that this can be actualized by God's grace, not by our own will, yes. right, yeah. Calvin, but by God's grace working in and through us. And, and so the Sermon on the Mount becomes a possibility. It's not just some ideal. It's, it's actually a real possibility for the world and for our lives. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I, I figured I, I sent that question and realized that's way too you know you could you could form some some massive tome you series could. around it. yeah you could yeah. but i think thematically what i just offered uh, you know scratches the itch that you're that you're getting at is is how does someone in these kinds of communities read not just the sermon on the mount but scripture in general okay okay so <laughs> that's definitely that's going to be more for me to dig into but, yeah um so that wraps up what i what i wanted to talk Great. about um thank Great. you doctor for your time yeah um yeah you're welcome. And uh, hopefully uh, um, in the future, uh, we'll talk soon. Well, I want to buy the puzzle, so I'm going to go on online. <laughs> I love it. All right. Now, yeah. To be clear, that was not the goal. This was <laughs> No, no, no. I know it's not, but I think it's great. I think it's really great, actually. That's I hope good. you keep it. I hope you, I hope you keep it going. 
with Thank this you. this uh this this line the, the the sort of trajectory you're on with this because there's a lot out there that i think people would resonate with that that's that's the goal of some of these discussions you know because i know this this kind of story can be it has been interpreted thousands and thousands of ways yeah. and sometimes it's that it that creates its own anonymity you know i don't some people may not want some people may not know how to dig into it or they may not know how to want to dig into it properly so interviews like these videos like these can say mm -hmm. all right now we have some ways to digest these various ways of interpreting the sermon on the mount yeah. and there's here's the shapes the various you know flavors and fragrances of sh yeah. shaping the sermon on the mount yeah so yeah. i'm yeah, going to keep work, on with this. good thank work you, sir. yeah thank you sir. all right all the best take care all right take care yeah